Welcome back, everybody, to the Growing Band Director Podcast. This is episode number 104, A Lesson Plan for Wellness with Lindsay Boyson and Crystal Smith. How's everybody doing? Good. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Good. Weather is awful today. Oh. Um, <laughs> it's really, really a bit of a monsoon out there. <laughs> I may have feared for my life on the way here. The things we do for our profession. But we are here. Yes. Yeah, we're here. To have a good talk about wellness. <laughs> yeah, you, you just did a clinic at MITA, too. Yeah, so the Massachusetts uh, Instrumental State Choral and Conductors Association um, just had their kind of summer institute. So I spent some time talking to some of their directors about prioritizing uh, changes in wellness, reducing stress, and kind of the impacts that our life um, as band directors, teachers, music teachers, kind of um, the impacts that that has on our general wellness. So it was really really cool talk and hopefully we can talk about some of that stuff today. Well received ice cream? Yes, very much so. It was fantastic. Um, I think it's much needed in kind of a, a profession that we spend a lot of time in professional development talking about our students and what we can do for them and all the newest kind of um, strategies to be the best teachers, but we don't necessarily spend a lot of time talking about what we can do for our teachers so that they can be happier, healthier versions of themselves. So, yeah. It's a really hard switch to make. You know, 100%. Because you, you don't want your program to go down, mm-hmm. right? Because you kind of attach your worth as a teacher, right, into like how well your kids play and how the program is. So, yeah, I think that's something we're all, all concerned about. I think when you step out of college and you have that, well, think about it. You're a senior in college. Your first semester of your music education is probably get, getting dedicated to your recital. So you're totally pedal to the metal, practicing hours mm-hmm. and hours a day, plus your regular rehearsals, plus when you're finishing up all your classes in your like regular um, degree program. Then you go and student teach, and you've got the commute, the 10-hour day, the evening rehearsals. You try to get to bed at a decent time, then you're up at 4 a.m. to do it all again for your last semester of college. You get a job, you go into your job, and you're like, oh, it's going to take 10 hours a day. And then when I'm not at school, I'm going to be thinking about what I can do for the next day that I'm at school, and the next day, and the next mm-hmm. day. And then I have to program for a month from now. And it's this cycle of nonstop. You think about it on your car ride. You think about it when you're in the shower. It, it is all consuming. This job becomes very and what we're doing is never good enough, it feels like. Never good enough. Yeah, I think, I think a lot of our work ethic is derived by how um, we simply want it to be where we are. Um, you know, I, I think about how we teach and um, the direction that, we, that a lot of directors take when kind of planning their program. And a lot of it has to do with this kind of idea of um, that we are still kind of teaching to the 1%. And so we were the 1%. And we were those students that wanted to go into music. And we know that only 1% or even less, and sadly right now, um, of students are going into music or music education coming out of high school. But we were that 1%. So we were used to that work ethic and practicing a lot and all of that. And so somehow that has, tran- for a lot of directors, that has transferred into just how they teach. They're always teaching to that 1% rather than maybe thinking about um, how they could approach teaching to everybody else and then that kind of relaxes job responsibilities, hours at work, um, the amount of hours that they're putting in, that kind of thing. So it's hard because as musicians, we're trained to have these kind of impeccable work ethics of, you know, practicing is perfect and the more we do, the better we'll get. But it's really kind of a disservice when we start thinking about the example that we're setting for students to encourage them to go into the profession. You know, if we think about it, as you said, Crystal, like all the things that we're doing, our students are seeing that. They're seeing we're stressed. We're see they're seeing that we're tired, that we're spending extremely long hours. They're seeing that. So how much of that is going to be um, something that students are going to be interested in as picking up as a future career too, mm-hmm. you know. Um, so I think about that a lot when I think about just 
the changes that maybe teachers can slowly start to make to kind of prioritize themselves a little bit more. Well, and we're 20 years in. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why I didn't really think about this 20 years ago, but I didn't. I really yeah. didn't. And, you know, obviously COVID happening made some big time changes and we had to think about basically starting over again. The last time we started over our program, we were 24 and 26 years old mm -hmm. and fresh and we're like we can do this like this is what we got to do but this time starting over was not going to be that way we have two kids mm -hmm. um we have other things in our life now and it wasn't going to be the same way so how do we like kickstart our program again and do all the things that it requires literally from almost nothing and make it happen without the amount of hours that we mm -hmm. used to put in which yeah. was literally 10 plus hours a day sometimes more yeah, I think, I and mean, we were just talking about this off camera and recording, I guess you say. <laughs> um, but just about, you know, I think it's really exciting to hear a director say, hey, I've, I've, you know, reduced that rehearsal from, you know, four days a week to three days a week. And it's really changed everything for the students and for me. I just work more efficiently. Have to be and more efficient. the product has not sacrificed. Yeah. It's amazing what, you know, we can do if we just kind of think a little bit differently about our teaching approach and how we use our time and our resources rather than kind of modeling. Um, a lot of us feel pressure to model our programs off of what it's been for years and years and years, just, you know, tradition and all of that that plays into how we do what we do. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, um, I think we do what we do better if we take the time to kind of prioritize ourselves before our jobs. Yeah. So. It's really hard to do. Mm -hmm. Definitely. It took me a while to come to that realization. It was actually after I left public school teaching and just I mean, through my health journey and realizing some of the ways that I treated myself during the time that I was teaching may or may not, you know, you never know, but may have contributed to some of the things that I was experiencing. And so part of, you know, why I'm kind of focusing on this and trying to bring this to schools and to teachers is that there are simple changes that you can make. Um, and stress reduction is one of them um, that will really help with longevity and health and happiness um, outside of the workplace. Mm -hmm. Because although we do spend a lot, a huge majority of hours of our life in our jobs, and luckily we do our jobs because we love them. So we have that going for us, mm -hmm. right? If you think about people who are in jobs that they don't love, that's a whole other problem. Um, so we are lucky to be, most of us are doing what we do because we're passionate about it. It brings us joy. We're helping the world. It's like we're bring, you know, we're doing something that is meaningful. And that alone is super powerful to being a healthy person and having a long, like fulfilling life. Um, but almost at our own detriment in a way because we love it so much that we end up doing it all the time and not knowing how to say no. For me, um, when we had kids, I made the determination, or we made the determination, that I, was, I wasn't going to have any evening rehearsals, mm -hmm. that everything, I was going to be home by dinner time, even in the busy days. And even now, even if I have something after school every day, if I say, okay, I know I'm going to be done by four o'clock, okay, now maybe once a week during the fall, it's going to be later than that, but if I can prioritize that, then I know I'm spending a certain amount of time at home. Um, the problem for me is when I'm home and I'm not doing something else, mm -hmm. I band. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like it's right. sort of my hobby, mm -hmm. you know, it's like you watch a movie or listen to music or like, I don't do a lot of other things. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's part of it too, is realizing that when you're thinking about it or worrying about it, that's adding stress. Right. Like we were talking about, you know, why is August stressful? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Heard somebody else say, and we've said this for years, that it's the Sunday of the summer. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, if anyone's on social media, it's been crazy lately yeah. with all the memes and the reels and the jokes about August and how teachers are feeling. That's very, very real. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and stress, it's interesting because stress, the way our bodies react to stress is the same regardless if the stress is actual stress. Mm -hmm. 
whether it's anticipated stress or for some of us, it's imaginary stress. Like we have anxiety, we worry about things that maybe aren't necessarily real. And so in August, think about all the things that we're thinking about, anticipating that might actually be happening. The stress is through the roof. And so, and then we're, and then we're told, well, we, it's still summer though. So relax, right? Try to relax. Um, and so, yeah, August can be really frustrating for teachers. Um, and I also think that comes from a very strange place of thinking that teachers can recover from their school years in two months and then be back and ready to go. Um, and that's a, a falsity um, that doesn't, our bodies are not designed, like they don't take on this, this like teacher kind of biological makeup and they don't just recover for two months and then be treated poorly for 10 and that that's going to work long term. It doesn't. Um, so it's kind of a cruel joke in a way. Uh, <laughs> summer break. I mean, I'm not going to knock it. I love my summer break, yeah. but it used to feel long though. It did it? feel long. And, and now, now yes, it, feel long it does not. It does not. <laughs> and then we get to August and the panic ensues. Mm-hmm. And part of that is because we know what the the school year looks like. And we're actually, I mean, yes, there are lots of things to look forward to. The fall is kind of this like rebirth of, you know, excitement and energy, but it's also for a lot of people, dread, exhaustion, tired, anxious, frustrated, all of these things. And it doesn't have to be that way. Um, there can be some balance. And I think that that's the key is trying it's never, you're never going to have um, work-life balance that's like perfect. Sometimes work is going to be, you know, way more than, than home and, and vice versa. But um, making your school year look a little bit more like summer is incredibly like helpful for your general like state of mind. We need some tips, Lindsay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, like, I wait, how do I bring you more into, into my school year? Before we talk about that, real yeah. quick, I did want to mention, I think it was episode 81 with Matthew Arau was like a, this was, that was another episode around all this stuff, which yeah. was a upbeat book. So um, if people are into that and haven't listened to that one, they should. Okay. So bringing the summer into Oh, the bringing the, the summer into the school year. year. Yeah. Well, I, you know, when I, I recent, when I recently talked to my guy had, and this is an easy trick that everybody can kind of do at home, but write down all of the things that you've done this summer that have given you joy. And for most people, like, oh, I sat on the beach and I went for a walk, or I did this, or I was able to cook meals, or I was spending time with my family. Those are all of the things that give us joy, that reduce our stress, that make us happier. And believe it or not, simply reducing our stress level and bringing joy into our life actually helps our like our physical health and our mental health but so making a list of the things that you do during the summer oftentimes people don't do any of their hobbies and I know Kyle you were talking about how we'll get back to that in a minute hobbies that are not banned Um, (laughs) like it's very easy Um, I guess we could just segue into that for a minute but it's very easy for music to become our entire identity Um, And again, it goes back to loving what we do so much, but at some point when we do only do that, burnout will happen. Mm -hmm. It's inevitable. And we start to then become, I don't know, not bitter. That's a strong word, but, but we start to have like a negative connotation that goes with our job. So I think that's what raises our stress is that it becomes all consuming. Mm -hmm. We don't have outlets to do other things. And I think one of the easiest shifts that, and the most like happy, successful people that I see in, in the teaching profession are people that also have other outlets that they're doing, whether it's a side hustle, whether it's a hobby, whether it's a booming social life. Like, I mean, it's some of those things, like not, it's going to be unique to everybody. Mm-hmm. Um, but remembering to prioritize, and that goes back to summer. We do all that fun stuff in summer. We can still do the fun stuff. We just have to think about it a little bit differently. Know that it's not going to be as much as summer, but we still need to like include it in our weekly kind of schedule. So how do I get my one o'clock summer nap? Okay, that's how it happens. 
<laughs> if it's feeling if you're not doing the job, it might lose your job. Yeah, but. so one of the things one of the things for me that's stressful about the school year is feeling like you're on a treadmill. Mm-hmm. Like I can tell you in three months what I'm doing at seven eighteen. Like that's stressful to me. Okay. You know that they're we're up at a certain time, you're leaving at a certain time, that there's no flexibility in a lot of things. Mm-hmm. Now I know the attitude we have and the things we choose to do at school, who we surround ourselves with, the approach we take, that takes that all takes into account those things that can make it better. Um, for me, getting out early enough is a big deal. Uh, I, one of the hobbies I like to do is exercise. Mm-hmm. The problem with that exercise is that you want to do it so much, right? If you do yeah. it too much, then that's a problem. Mm-hmm. Um, I would consider the podcast a hobby. That is a great right? hobby. So, mm-hmm. Yes, it is well hobby. banned, but, yeah. <laughs> but I love this for you because I think it is an outlet for you to get away from the regular kind of rigmarole of everything Mm -hmm. that you're doing, the routine. And I think, so you make a really good point about there are parts of our day in the school year that are uncontrollable for us. And in the summer, we can't take the one beyond that. Um, I I recently kind of changed how I thought about, because I think we spend a lot of time making a day-to-day schedule. And it's really hard to be consistent. It's easy to be consistent about a lot of things on a day to day. Like you could get up and have the same water and breakfast and then go to work. and But when you're trying to implement hobbies and other kinds of things into your life, any kind of self care, um, I like to think about it on a, on a week, weekly schedule versus um, a daily schedule. So it's human nature. Like we're kind of used to this 24 hour, idea, but if we really think about all the hours that we have in an entire week to accomplish, yes, however many 40, 50, 60 hours of those week or those hours of that week are going to be dedicated to work. But how can we intentionally carve out um, the other, you know, set of hours to do the things that we want to do, whether it is a side hustle, whether it is exercising, you know, instead of thinking I have to exercise every single day from three to four, that might work for someone. It also might say, okay, I have a week. I'm going to prioritize some weight training three days a week. And this week I can do Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Next week I could only do Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, whatever it is. And so I think oftentimes the daily and the routine is actually fairly limiting to us and can cause a lot of stress. When if we think about it a little bit more on a broader scale of the entire week, yeah, I might not be able to go out and you know get drinks with my girlfriends on a Monday through Friday. But I know it's on Saturday and that gives me joy to know that on Saturday I'm going to do that and that I prioritize my social life for the week. Um, yeah, so I think a lot of that we do in the summer without thinking about it because we don't have the job. So we can say, you want to go do this and we go do it. Mm -hmm. Um, It just has to look a little bit different in the fall. Mm -hmm. You have to intentionally make time for, hey, I'm going to whatever. I'm going to go to trivia night. I'm going to do whatever your thing is. Um, The fact that we sacrifice all of that for 10 months out of the year and then expect when we get to summer that we're going to make ourselves less stressed. And then we go back into a very stressful environment without making any changes. It's actually even harder on our bodies. And one thing that's hit me too is that, well, first of all, if I'm scheduling one more thing, I feel like that's stressful. Even if okay. I'm scheduling it, uh-huh. right? That's, that's my problem. <laughs> but secondly... It's very normal, by the way. <laughs> secondly, I realized that no matter how stressed I am in front of the band, they sound the same. Mm-hmm. Whether or not I'm in front, like really stressed about how they sound or relaxed about how they sound, like changing mindset, my mindset mm-hmm. while I'm in front of a mediocre band, mm-hmm. right? Not being happy if they sound good or really, I mean, how many days have we come at home like just gritting our teeth because the band sounded bad, you know? <laughs> we, were, we were on a it's walk like, yesterday. Kyle and I walk a lot in the summer. And of course, we talk about band when we're walking. <laughs> so I really hard. Every time we go into the conversation, we're like, we're not going to talk about band this time. We'll think, you know, talk about something else. And then by the end of the walk, guess what? We're talking about band again. But it was literally the end of the walk. And Kyle looks at me and he's like, you know, band's probably not going to sound very good in September. But we know how they're going to sound at the end of the year, right? And I'm like, yeah, because... 
it's been that way for like years and years. Like we we know the outcome, and it doesn't matter how we're feeling about this particular year going in. We know we're gonna do our thing, and some days we're gonna grit our teeth when we get home because it sounded so bad, and we usually have like a venting session about it. And by the end of the year, we're like, yeah, it happened. We did it. They sound good. <laughs> they did great. Yeah. <laughs> I think that, I mean, for even for younger, this could be the case for, for more experienced teachers, but I think younger teachers put a lot of pressure on themselves to, you know, every day there's going to be some kind of like a moment that like there's going to be, imp- and I love that you just said, we know by the end of the year, yep. we're going to get there yep. because it's a, it's a journey, right? Totally. Like the, it's, it's not. And so we put a lot of pressure on ourselves a lot of stress to have every single solitary day be at this, you know, level of, of improvement. Yes, we want to improve every day, but I mean, the improvement might be that, I don't know, I, I used to joke that, that I'd have an oboe player that um, I would turn to the oboe player and, and they always say, I have a read problem. <laughs> <laughs> I would never hear the oboe player actually play. And I remember my, one of my, one day I was like, they actually played a note. Well, that's enough for today. That's, that's an that's accomplishment. accomplishment. There was not a read issue today, you know? Um, you have to kind of find the, the little things, and it's not always going to be a huge, huge accomplishment for the day because what you are looking for is, yeah, where are you getting the middle of the year? A, where, if you're high school, where are you getting them after four years? I mean, yeah. there, there's longevity in that plan, not just instantaneous, you know, gratification. There's a level of corollary with exercise and a lot of other things, too, mm-hmm. with consistency. Mm-hmm. Right. We talk about if you're really consistent at something over many months and years, you will see progress. You will see what you earn, what they earn. That was um, uh, not intensity. That was pretty overwhelming to me. I remember even early on because of all of the things you want to accomplish with mm-hmm. a group, you all, you want them all to have great posture. You want them all to live a great tone. You want them all to be awesome rhythmically. You want them all to have a lot of fluency on their instrument. You want them all to be able to sight read well. Like there's all these things and there's all of these techniques that you can adopt to make all of that happen. But that was overwhelming to me. Like how do you do all that? And people talk about you do five minutes of this, you do five minutes of this, you do. And then I was like, this just doesn't feel right at all. So Kyle and I, I think I've mentioned this on a podcast before, but we went to visit Linda Gannon um, right before she retired in Virginia. Patty was like two, so it was probably seven years ago or so. Nope, a lot longer than that. Ten years ago. She's 12 now. Um, and she was talking about tone. And she was like, tone is, is huge. It like leads to so many other things. It's, there's all these things that you can think about. Um, she has a whole clinic on not just the B-flat scale as right. like a warm-up, and that was like her thing. And so Kyle and I like thought about it for a while, and we're like, okay, We're going to do all the things. We want to do all the things, but we're going to have one focus this year, and we got to get these bands to play with better top top. That was like the thing. And we still worked on everything else, but there was this one focus, and what a remarkable difference that actually made instead of five minutes here, five minutes here, five minutes here. That was a huge game changer for us Mm -hmm. as a program. And then... You know, another year it was like, yes, we're still going to do all of these things with tone, but we're going to start to slowly incorporate something else that's going to be our focus for the year. And then over four years of time, these kids who were freshmen with him, by the time they were seniors, his band sounded remarkably different. And mine did too, even just taking a completely different approach from the beginners to the eighth graders. Um, so yeah, it's like that consistency versus intensity mm-hmm. that made the biggest difference and relaxed our stress level thinking about how we're going to frantically fit in all the important things in a rehearsal. Like I try to, so I try to think of, if you think of one to 10, one being 10 being the most intense, right? Um, your planning and preparation, I try to be at like a nine or 10. That's thinking about, uh, thinking about the future. When it comes to how I'm actually approaching that day of teaching, mm-hmm. I try to live in like the seven range. Like, I try to be really good, but not too amped up, but I try to have every single day be a 7, mm-hmm. um, rather than trying to be a 10 for the next week, and then being a 4 for the next yeah. few weeks. Yeah, So you burn out when you're right. a 10. You burn out when you're a 10, and I think that it's very common for music teachers to have a very, like, 
warped idea that they should be at a 10 all the time. When they might be thinking they're at a 10, but at some point, as you said, the burnout, the exhaustion is going to become very real and they will be at a 4, even if they're still trying to be a 10, you know? Um, and you're not going to get the results even if you are at a 10. Like, you're, you're still dealing with kids mm -hmm. who are human, yeah. who have all of these other things going on, so it doesn't matter if your intensity is there they're not going to be there with you because they're kids and they have a completely different mindset in the band room than we do. And one thing that can lower your stress level is under programming, just a little bit, mm -hmm. like programming easier music so you can really get them to achieve really well. I'm not saying don't challenge your students, right? But Go listen to the Tiffany Hits yeah. that podcast. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, the, other, the other thing is for those people who have really young kids in their band records right now, um, I feel your pain. Mm -hmm. Or if you're going to be having kids, um, it's a hard few years. Mm. I, I guess for everybody's different. I mean, for us, we were both band directors and obviously the two parents of the kids, so that maybe that was unique, but some people at the time were telling me, oh, it gets harder, this is the easy spot. Wait till they're teenagers, it's so much harder. Mm -hmm. My kids aren't teenagers yet, but it's so much easier. Yeah. Like, I I, if I want to sleep in a couple minutes, I can. Mm -hmm. You know, the getting them in the car, I mean, the amount of days I got to school and I was wearing my slippers, because they were ready, but I didn't get myself ready, so exhausted, right? And literally, you drop the kid off at daycare, and then within six minutes, you're at your bedroom door, right. you're late. And then you're starting. And, and, <laughs> yeah. your face and, and, well, and in the lobby, I would have 42 kids, like, sitting in the lobby chatting. And I'm like, I'm carrying four bags. Yeah. Like, I can't even get in the room. Like, can you guys part the way? So, and then all of a sudden, there's kids everywhere. And there was just one of those, like, I almost burned out that year. It was like... There was just so much. So for the people who have young kids or whatever, it's not forever. And be conscious about how you're dealing with stuff with your young kids. I think so too. And, and I think another good way to look at that is if you are, and this goes for people who are just trying to prioritize partners or even just have other things going on than just children. But um, when you're young, it's I think it's really important to, try to kind of practice um, less stress and kind of really try to figure out your efficient way of teaching, although, although you're still learning how to teach. Teach a lot of the way. Um, it, it, knowing and kind of figuring that out before you have kids, before yep. you are trying to do a lot of other things, um, I think that that is really helpful. I didn't, I didn't have that. Well, that being um, said, you think you know what it's like you to have think, kids, but right? then you have kids and mm -hmm. it's not. Yeah, and, and I was, I had both, I have three, but I had both my my oldest two, like 22 months apart, and I was in the throes of like an enormous, you know, high school band program, and I was trying to do all of that, and I had no idea, and this is part of why I'm doing this now, no idea how to prioritize myself, let alone then have children on top of it and try to juggle all of that. Mm -hmm. um, so... I think that trying to figuring that out before, if you're able to, you know, life throws you all different kinds of curveballs. But like, if you're able to kind of figure out how you can kind of balance the the school and the and the personal, I guess. Let's talk about some routines. Yeah. Like routines that work for you guys, or routines that we know work. I'll say one, like being able to get outside for a 15 minute mm -hmm. walk. Well, I was going to say, so you're walking all the time in the all summer. The you got to somehow manage to find a way to do that in the fall, too. Yeah. Uh, or just all throughout the entire school year. Um, so I think that... And they say morning first, time is so important to do that. Morning time like, is, yeah. But how do you do it that? Doesn't you really it doesn't necessarily work. I know, a lot of, us. I know <laughs> lots of people who love a, a morning workout session. That is not going to happen for me. Nope. It's not ever going to happen. I've tried to. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a lot of research out there about a morning routine, and but we're teachers, and our morning starts early enough as it is. And honestly, um, I would rather suggest to uh, folks to prioritize sleep over getting up early so that you can do other things. Um, so I think part of it is sleep, and there's a couple of like practices that. Um, that are really helpful with that. The first is I had someone probably when I was 22 tell me, don't, this is for you, Kyle, don't bring work home with you. Mm -hmm. um, that was one of the biggest, and I ignored it. I mean, I, I said somebody told me when I was 22, and I probably didn't do it until I was about 35. Um, and so 
don't bring work home. And I think part, some of the things that interrupt our ability to get good sleep at night and to connect with our families or to do other things is we have devices. We can check our email at all times. We can think about what we're going to do. And if we can try very hard to say, okay, maybe if I stay at school for an extra half an hour to get a few things done, that's fine. But then that work stays there. Because even though we are not in corporate America, we're teachers, a lot of people do not bring their jobs home like that. Mm-hmm. When they clock out, it's done. And then they are, we are we are a profession where we love to bring everything we do home with us. Mm-hmm. We talk about it, we work on it, we obsess over it. Anyway, if we can just leave it there, even if we have to stay a little bit later to get it done, once we leave, we Turn a switch on that says, this is my time. One of the things that's in the Upbeat Leadership book is the keeping a, a bedtime journal. Mm-hmm. Things that went well that day or things you're planning on for tomorrow. Yeah. And they say that when you put it down in that journal, mm-hmm. that then it kind of frees your mind and it's better to... Yeah, a lot of people have like a release of that for sure. Um, and and just like setting a consistent bedtime every single night. I know that's really hard and for Even on the weekend. Even like on the weekend. It's a huge deal. It is because yeah. people... Yeah, I mean... And I know this from having children, I, because I am very like regimented with their sleep because I think it's it's important. But getting off those screens late in the night, so at least an hour or two before you're going to go to bed, like switch to a book and like dim the lights and just kind of create like our bodies are reacting to circadian rhythms. So at night, if we have every light on in the house and we're staring at our cell phone or computer screen, our body's confused. And so if we put the work away. We, like, get in a, a mood to, to go to sleep, um, and then we prioritize, like, the eight, nine hours of sleep that us grown adults need. Um, when I go to bed at 8.30, I feel so great. Yeah, that don't you? It's amazing. So but, I mean, I, I can think off the top of my head that that probably doesn't happen for a lot of people, especially people who are in a really, like, high intense kind of program where they're rehearsing into all hours of the night and then I don't know about you but when you come home from a concert or something you've done something you're all like it's adrenaline right there's no going to sleep so now if you're doing that every single night and you're pumped up from the rehearsal you just had until 8 o'clock at night and then you're trying worse than being in front of a bad band (laughs) when you're exhausted (laughs) yeah like that's just torture right Um, there's a name that I I think people should look up his name's Matthew Walker he is like probably the I don't, I don't know this for sure, but one of the world's most foremost sleep study experts is in California. Um, if you just go into your podcast app and search Matt Walker, yeah. you can find a bunch of podcasts that he's been on. And it's fascinating, the whole science of sleep, the amount of things you learn from listening and talking about mm-hmm. sleep. I could listen and talk about sleep forever. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's so funny. We don't realize, if there was one easy thing that you were going to do this year to just improve your health and your sanity and your mental health and it's just add a couple hours to sleep on and work on your sleep hygiene. Like, get in a routine where you're going to bed. Again, you can't stay up until 2 a.m. on Saturday night and expect that your body is going to recover. Your, what, what he says is if you go to bed late on Friday and wake up three hours mm-hmm. late, you're giving yourself jet lag every single day. Oh, yeah, day. yeah. And it's just like Monday morning, it's jet lag. Yeah. And the sleep, and the sleep is incredibly important just of uh, our whole body's ability to kind of detoxify everything and recover. So, and recover. So like it's helping our brain work at its like highest capacity and it's also allowing our body to do what it needs to do to kind of be in its most optimal state. So if we're sacrificing that on a daily basis and not allowing that to happen, that is one reason why we don't feel great. And, and that's one reason why, and over time that has a huge impact on what our health is going to look like. And, you know, we won't all retire and, and we energetic and healthy and we don't want our jobs to have taken a toll on ourselves for 30, 35 years and then when we have the time to do other things, we can't. This you know? may seem like a random thought, but remember when we decided we were going to spend $3,000 on the mattress? Yeah. <laughs> right? So like, yeah. I remember for so many times in my life thinking, it's a mattress, like who cares? Mm-hmm. But if you're younger now and you're like starting to get into like you go a job and you're earning some stuff, like spend the money on a uh, mattress is really good for you because it'll make all, all the difference. Um, what other routines? We talked about sleep, and I mean, we touched on sleep, right? We, we touched on sleep, right? We don't have the a sleep, yeah, we don't have the expertise, and, and but I think that sleep is huge. Fresh air, fresh air, exercise. movement. 
getting out in the sun. So part of, and again, I am not a, a medical professional, but it is not, it is pretty common knowledge. Your mom's a pretty close. I'm pretty, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's pretty common knowledge yeah. that a majority of, of um, people in our country have a significant vitamin D deficiency. Um, and vitamin D is like a host of, of of health benefits, um, and there's a lot of really cool science coming out just in chronic disease and all different kinds of things. But at the most basic level, vitamin D gives us a lot of energy and does a lot of great things for our bodies, and we're spending increasingly more time indoors, away from natural light, at computers, in cubicles, in our classrooms. I don't know about you, but my classroom didn't have any, at my office, when I taught school, didn't have any windows in it. Yeah. I was literally in a closet on the days that, like, the time that I wasn't teaching, and sometimes Sorry. I wouldn't even see the light of day, right? And that's just terrible for you. Um, and so just getting outside in nature every single day, moving your body, and that does not necessarily mean exercising, like, in a traditional go-to-the-gym workout sesh, that's great for you. But just the simple task that you guys walking is huge. Um, and there's tons of science out there about just the benefits long, long-term of I remember, walking. I remember going to school with somebody at Forget her name, she was a singer. She was in her 50s. Mm-hmm. And she's like, Oh, yeah, she had to figure it out. Yeah. She was like pretty in shape, you know, not intense. She's like, Yeah, my husband and I walk three and a half miles every day. I eat whatever I want. I'm fine. <laughs> she's like, She but her point was that she didn't obsess about everything because she because that she made her feel doing, good that yeah. she was outside. And, yeah, I think there's, and there's a lot to be said for that. I, there's a couple in my neighborhood that I mean, they must walk at least three every day when I see them. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. That's great. That's there's another episode. We listen to Mind Pump. I don't know if you ever listened yeah, to Yeah, I've heard. Yeah. Okay. They did an episode called um, The Science of Happiness. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you've listened to this one. Oh, it, yeah. It's literally one you can listen to three or four times. Yeah. I don't remember the episode number, but it's in the summer of 23. I forget who they have on, but it's like this world-renowned happiness expert. And it was like so... It was one of the most amazing sessions I've ever listened to. That's awesome. People should check that out. It's really good. Yeah. Um, any other routines we have talked about? Well, food is fuel. Yeah. yeah. Well, well you did mention we could just walk and eat whatever, whatever we wanted, want. Kyle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, wait a second here. Wait a I think what she meant was she didn't have to count her calories. Because she knew she was... <laughs> That's such an old antiquated model. Yeah. Right? <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah, the food is fuel is huge. Like, if you can look at f- food for the most part, it's not pleasure, but food, but but fuel. Well, it changes your whole mindset. And again, if you're consistent about eating, again, I'll say at a level of eight or nine, at a, you don't have to be perfect. Yeah, no, but, and but perfect like if is... you consistently eat well and put in good food in your body, then you can cheat and you don't really mm-hmm. care about it. Yeah, and I think that's. And not, I mean, obviously, I, I love to follow a good health and wellness, like, influencer, blog, or whatever, but I think there's also, the, the market is saturated with information on how you should do it, and which way you should do it, and whatever. And, and the fads and the trends. Don't, and the fads and the trends, and I don't, I don't prescribe that, because I think that every single person has a very unique relationship with food. I think that everyone's body needs something different in order to feel optimal. So I don't think that I could sit here and say, um, you should do X, Y, and Z, nor am I qualified. However, there are just some general trends that um, are kind of facts that you can keep in mind when preparing um, your meals and what what you're going to eat for the week. I think as teachers, one of the best things you can do is to bring your lunch and not to eat school lunch. And this is not me knocking school lunch, but this means you, when you bring it, you control what you eat. Um, and yes, there's a set menu, but, but you, you not, can't control. It is not the same. So, you know, the best things for you to do is if to prioritize whole foods that are natural, that are not created in a science lab or full of lots of chemicals that we don't know um there's you know there's the 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 saying that if you don't if you can't read or understand the the ingredients on the label then maybe you shouldn't be putting it into your body they say you should eat like your great great grandma yeah yeah just think about like when they had a farm and they were 
you know, creating their own crops and, and getting their own meat and fishing. And like, that's, that's what our bodies are designed to take in. And they're, our bodies were not made to take in processed food. So, you know, as much as it's yummy, don't get me wrong, I love a good chip once in a while or whatever. <laughs> and again, as Kyle said, cheat it, yeah. But if that is your main diet, you know, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and you're putting, you know, sugary drinks and, you know, sodas and lots and lots and lots of caffeine all day long and um, processed foods, your body's probably not feeling great. Yeah, you're probably, probably, yeah, probably not sleeping great. You're probably either. not sleeping great. So if you're, if, and I remember doing that. I mean, oh, I got a, a seven o'clock rehearsal tonight or a six o'clock rehearsal. Let me have a giant iced coffee <laughs> at 530 from Duncan's. And it's like, and then I get home and wonder why I couldn't sleep, right? right? And so, I mean, and that's common practice. So if you're doing that, that might be why you're I have a friend who's had a soda. Yeah. That's and a and probably he drop. lost 40 yeah. pounds. Yeah. He has. 40 pounds. He's like, I didn't do anything. Yeah. Like, Dr. King soda. Right. And honestly... I would rather eat my calories in some luxurious, you know, like dessert or whatever than just drink like a bunch of empty calories of sugar. So what is it that people don't get enough of? Protein. Yeah. It's It's for for sure protein. I I think that protein is going to be your best fuel. It's going to keep you satiated the longest. Um, It's going to like for us, I don't know about all of you, but. We're out the door before Mm seven o'clock, and it's teach, 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 and then somewhere between twelve and one, yeah, right. Maybe sit down. Sit down down might be or maybe between nine forty and ten, right? Right. Depending on what school you teach at. It's wild, but um, like our meal times are not very well structured in our lives. So having protein when we do get to eat is major. Like that is the only way that we have found a way to sustain those hours. What is the recommendation for amount of protein regarding your body weight? It's I what I'm seeing right now, and I've confirmed this through many sources, is 0.75 to one gram of body weight. Yeah. So if you weigh 120 pounds, somewhere between 100 and 120 grams of protein. Um, if you have no idea how to figure that out, I use an app called Chronometer that has a, a really great way to track. You can just throw in your food for a day and see how much protein you have in there. Most people are like between. When I survey a group of people, they'll say like between. 30 and 50 is kind of what I see on average. And they average. should be 150. And they should be like well above 100. And so if that seems super unattainable, I would say go for 100. Like start with that and see if you can get to 100 consistently and then try to see if you can get closer to your body weight. And I've had so many kids come in in the morning because yeah. all the kids hang out in the bank room yeah. and they're drinking rock star. Honey bun. And they're like, oh. Oh. And then they feel like garbage. Well, and I would say, this is, I would say, this is why you're so useless. <laughs> and, and then they laugh. And I'm like, well, so clearly they know I'm joking. And these are like no, some of the best very, kids. Very but, true. And then they come in one day and they're super wide eyed mm-hmm. and they're excited. And they're like, Mr. Smith, I had protein this morning. I feel amazing. Yeah. It's like, yeah. Mm-hmm. Been t- trying to tell you for four years, and you four finally figured it out. Oh, that that's <laughs> hard for me. There's um, there's a really cool functional medicine doctor named Will Cole, and does a lot of work on um, the relationship between food and mental health, and it's not as or well being or something like that. But um, essentially, oh no, the book is gut feelings, and it's really really fantastic, and it makes me think about this when you said you see your students, and I I see the same thing. I see what they can bring into class, you know. And I just kind of survey the room. And it's not out of judgment. It's more like, oh, this is where you are. This is why you're uh, – and, oh, and part of yeah. his um, research is on mental health and food and how a lot of the connection between the way our brain is reacting and wired and changing and altering has a lot to do with what we're putting and ingesting into our body. It's really fascinating research. Um, and basically, you know, he's kind of implying that a lot of our anxiety and depression and kind of different um, mental health um, diagnoses can often be not like sure, he's not saying that, but improved by diet and lifestyle and prioritizing protein and not just eating empty carbs and sugar and processed food and drinks that are made out of who knows what. 
Um, and it's really, really powerful research. And we can take that into us as teachers and think about our stress levels and all of those. That's all connected to the hormones that are in our, that are fueling, like are throughout our body and reacting in our brain. So if we're not, we're, all, we're not only experiencing stress, but then we're not, we're fueling our body with things that are not helping us manage that stress then that's where things start to improve. And, and the quality of protein is huge too. Oh, definitely. If you have like good eggs, people talk about, I don't want eggs so much because of cholesterol. Well, if you have like farm eggs, mm -hmm. cholesterol is lower. Um, and I, I challenge people, if you actually try to eat the amount of protein you think you should have, it's almost hard some days. Mm -hmm. Like you get, you get really full, but like it makes it so you don't want to eat all the other stuff because, and you're not Way hungry at all. Way less cravings. It's not cheap though. No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, neither is being sick, though. I know. I mean, being sick mm -hmm. is really expensive, too. Um, I do want to touch on meal prep a little bit, though, because we were talking about bringing your, bringing your food. And, and yes. this is sometimes a challenge for teachers because you get home and, like, the last thing you want to do is actually make your food for the next day. So, um, Ty and I, last year, I got 10 glass containers with lids. And on Sundays, I make a giant or double batch of like a dinner, for instance. It could be, uh, I don't know, one time I made a bolognese and, and pasta and had, <laughs> oh, he's, he mm, that's good. <laughs> um, and, and made 10 portions of this. Right. Stack it in the fridge. That was on a winter day. Um, one day I made a, a salad that had chicken and I used cabbage so that it wouldn't well to like lettuce because lettuce would get gross. Yeah, it can get a little gross over the week. Yeah. yeah. But the cabbage seemed to like be a little bit firmer. So made 10 of those and then we didn't even think about it. So I have to like really plan. It takes me about an hour to an hour and a half on Sundays, but that has been really huge for us to like have that settled and done for the week. And all of those meals are high protein. But every single one of them. I don't make it if it's not going to have time for protein. Well, and then you know, you know what you're setting up for, at least for those five days of school week. Like, okay, I know that at lunch, I'm going to do this. You can control what you're, you know, you're feeling in the morning. But like during, the, and, and I think for some people, um, you know, my trick is I, I almost always just make a heavier dinner, like a, with an ounce, tons of um, and so that I have, a, some people yeah. like have a, a really weird, like personal, for leftovers, but I don't mind them. Yeah, are you? Are you long? Long? Okay. Some people are like, nope, I ate it. I cannot possibly eat it the next day. You know, whatever. Um, but I think that's a great trick too. Like yeah. if you are going to make something, and especially if you're prioritizing, you know, eating better, you're going to put that effort into making dinner because it's usually during a time where you at least have a little bit more time to make something versus in the morning if you're trying to throw your lunch together. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, and then, like, the trick on the salad, because I eat a salad. I'm a vegetarian, which makes protein very difficult for me. I am a vegetarian so simply by choice, not for any, like, enormous, you know, viewpoints on anything. It's just a personal thing. Um, but it makes eating protein and prioritizing protein really, really challenging. Mm -hmm. um, and so when I'm making a salad, I really have to think about what are the other elements of protein that I'm going to be able to add. Onto that, yeah. um, I also like to prep salads, but then just leave the, the lettuce separate. So then in the morning, like I'll have everything else prepped for the week, but then I'll grab the like the lettuce onto the, the thing <laughs> so that it's fresh and it hasn't been sitting in there. Because you yeah. know, once it all starts yeah, marinating, it's all gross, right? <laughs> um, yeah. So I would say the only other thing on top of, and I joked with this in my presentation a couple weeks ago, is the cat your vegetables into your diet. Big fiber is the best thing that your body loves fiber and most of America doesn't need enough fiber. Um, and I don't need to go into why fiber is important other than it really helps our body like be its optimal state and detoxify and, and do all the things that our body is supposed to do every single day. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, the more vegetables that you can in include with your protein, um, the better. So. Have fish at least once a week. Gotta love those more. omegas, right? Yeah. <laughs> Good for your Let, brain. Let's heart. talk about smoothies. Oh, so that's like, about if, smoothies. If, if, if people don't know, <laughs> that's like, the go-to for us in the morning. Yeah. That's why he's talking about it yeah. because this was a game changer. Well, because it's not. We're not talking about getting a can of insure and calling that a smoothie. No, 
<laughs> Great. I'm not sure what teacher also has time to like, I'm going to scramble some eggs. Everybody talks about like a beautiful breakfast. And I'm right. like, beautiful breakfast. Like, what are you talking about? I don't even, I can't even think in the morning. I drink my breakfast in the car. Uh-huh. Yep. <laughs> I can do it. But again, another way to get a pretty um, high amount of protein is, and it's quick. It takes like five minutes. Um, and I kind of fight over who gets the blender first. But we are able to drink our, our smoothie in the car on the way to work. Mm-hmm. And that was huge for us too because we don't have the time to make breakfast in the morning. And if you're one of those people that eats like a bar on the way to school, you are probably going to be hungry by like 8 o'clock uh-huh. in the morning. <laughs> I don't know yeah. why. And we, just because it says protein lot, bar doesn't mean it's something you should eat. Yeah, we tried a lot of different things before we yeah. kind of got to this, but... You know, a clean protein, a whey or pea protein. Um, both Kyle and I put egg whites in our protein, which is put in our smoothie, which is smoothie. You guys are hardcore. I know. <laughs> I, I really wanted the egg whites. Um, <laughs> collagen, we all lose collagen 1% every year after we turn 20. What does so collagen do for you? Collagen is obviously for your hair, skin, nails, but also for your joints. Um, so those of you who suffer with aches and pains, sore muscles, things like that. What's your mind? Your mind, I mean, there's a lot, it's a protein, so it's gonna, it's not a complete protein, so you definitely need to eat You can just take a scoop and put it in. Yeah, but you can add fruits and vegetables in there, talking about that, getting fiber right away in your body. A healthy fat, yeah, I mean, I don't know. Like a good chocolate, banana, peanut butter smoothie? Um, Happened two days ago. I know. I but think, that's I, like, I think I got that recipe from you guys. I feel like, like, it's like it should be the teacher's go-to breakfast because unless you all have time to sit and make your so breakfast. actually what I do because I've had history of like getting lightheaded and not having enough food mm-hmm. or whatever. So I actually will have like eggs or sausage or something in the morning. So when I go to school, I have had something, and I also have my shake with me. But I don't. Sometimes I don't drink my shake till eight o'clock, nine right. o'clock, yeah. and I'll kind of drink it through the couple of classes. Mm-hmm. And my kids know I'm always looking for my shake bottle and yeah. whatever. But that way, I know I have something with me, and I'm, I'm not hungry. Well, and I think that goes back to like how every single person body is designed differently. Yeah. Like some some people, I'm I'm similar in that um, I probably eat more like smaller meals across like the course of the day. Like I I want to have something, whether it's a shake or some you know. Even if, uh, and that's the nature of my job too. I mean, I teach four classes at a university back to back to back to back. And so I'm usually eating my lunch in like 10 minute spurts. That's right. And, and yeah. that's not healthy. I mean, it's not ideally, yes, I'd like to sit down and eat, but I can't. So then you really have to just adjust like, okay, I gotta prioritize what I'm eating and when I'm eating so that I don't feel lightheaded, dizzy, because I do feel the same way. Mm-hmm. Like, if I don't have you know, the right kind of balance in my body. I'll definitely feel off from mm-hmm. it. Um, and some people, the, the sad thing is, is that I think that there's a lot of people who feel like that on a daily basis and don't know why. Yep. Yep. And and that's partly why we're having this conversation is that like maybe someone listening will say, huh, well, I do. I also feel like that when I get hungry. I'm like, well, okay, there's a reason. Yep. And that's not doing great things for your body, especially long term. So let's find a solution for that. I was going to ask you something. Um, I forgot what it was. I, I think I'll, I'll get it here. Um, it was about. Yeah. Oh. Um, tell us about your new venture. Oh, sure. Well, I mean, it's a slow rollout for sure. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about. Well, I think I've already alluded to just I, I had gotten sick. Um, five years ago almost now, which is really exciting because I'm like, ooh, it's five years. Um, but I got diagnosed with breast cancer and uh, when I was 38, which just kind of just threw me for a really big loop um, because I felt like I was a very healthy person. Um, didn't really know what that looked like, but as like, we've already talked about, I'm not sure I was the most healthiest person. And so when you start, I think when anyone gets um, presented with any kind of like a diagnosis or you're feeling a certain way, we're teachers, we research, we gather information. And so I just kind of went down a rabbit hole of wanting to learn more about maybe why I got sick, what I could do to prevent ever getting sick again, or maybe limiting my risks, and just trying to be healthier from myself and my family. And so about a year ago, I started a program um, which was like an integrative kind of medicine approach or functional approach to nutrition and just overall wellness. 
and I did that. And then I just thought, okay, I think my niche or like the people I want to focus on are teachers. And I, and I said at the beginning of this, you know, we're, we're used to getting PD on things that are going to help our students or the latest and greatest, you know, data or approach to education, but we're not really prioritizing how our teachers are feeling and burnout and early retirement, all of these things are happening at like an exponential rate. Um, and so I thought that if I created something that would offer professional development to teachers to help with stress and um, just kind of changing their approach to and considering um, their overall health and wellness, that that would be a really cool thing. So I'm doing that. Um, What's it called? Well, it's called LB, which is my, my initials, LB Integrative, but I like to call it a lesson plan for wellness because we do lesson plans for everything, but we don't do a lesson plan for wellness, or at least our own lesson plan for wellness. Um, and with that right now, I'm just kind of trying to share out um, information that I feel like will be helpful. So I have a blog, and then I also take on um, individual clients that want to work on you know, spending a good chunk of like 12 weeks working on trying cycles and kind of make strides in their health journey. So, yeah, that's where I'm at right now. It's pretty so exciting. So I know. So yeah. I remember the question I had for you. Okay. <laughs> We're all over the place. <laughs> ingredients. Like ingredients in food mm -hmm. that we shouldn't be having, but we don't even realize it's in there. Mm -hmm. I'm so bad at looking for these ingredients, but. The one I get you on all the time is soy you know, oil, but that kind of mm -hmm. <laughs> that goes into the category of seed oils. Yeah. There's a lot of uh, research out there about um, how seed oils are inflammatory, so we're, and they're in everything. They are in everything. everything. Canola oil is in everything from crackers to sauces to dressings to I mean, it's just super inflammatory. Um, so we stay away from those. It's made a pretty big difference. Um, my dad was diagnosed with cancer a couple of years ago, and they gave him zero advice on nutrition. Uh -huh. None. That's, that's part of why. And I know that yeah. that was big for you, too. Mm -hmm. And so, lo and behold, we're doing our own research, because that's what we do <laughs> as teachers, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And come to find out, you know, seed oils are super inflammatory, and so we took it out of his diet, too. Um, that's a big one for us. Um, we avoid soy as a family. It's harder to do when you're vegetarian. And and I avoid it too. Just there's some like the research is kind of back and forth on that when it comes to hormones and stuff like yeah. that. So I tend to stay away from it as well. I'm not saying it's bad. Yeah. I'm just saying that it, again, it's a personal choice. Like everyone has to totally. kind of really decide. And I remember um, when I was diagnosed, they it was I didn't even see a nutritionist. They kind of just like gave me a pamphlet. And I remember looking at it and being like. Mm, I'm pretty sure half this is not like good for you. Yeah. Like what? I'm not going to do this. And I did my own. And so I think that something we haven't talked about, but and this, I hope this is going to resonate with some people because I just had maybe several conversations with people about this in the last week. Um, if you are not proactive about learning about your body and finding out about where you are at, it's really hard to kind of improve from there. So when I say that is, if you've avoided going to the doctors for 15 years because you're afraid, which is a lot of people are, um, then you don't have the knowledge and the power to make choices to help yourself. Mm -hmm. That's an avoidance tactic that is extremely common. I'm too busy, I'm too, and at the end of the day, if you've avoided going to a traditional or even a functional doctor, just go to a doctor, get some blood work done. Like I know people like I haven't had blood work in ten years. Like every time I get the paper, it just goes away. Because yeah, because yeah, right when you go to the doctor now, they're like, here's your order, now go do it. Instead of you're at you're right here, let me do it right now. So like in order to kind of micromanage and 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 you know, um, everyone does their own thing now, it creates this really big gap where people are like okay, I went to the doctors, and I'll get this done eventually, but I don't. And then they never know. They don't know that, oh, maybe your cholesterol's a little high, or maybe my white blood cell count is all screwed up, and maybe there's a reason for that, and maybe it's an easy, easy fix. Yeah. But you're not going to know if you avoid the doctor. So yeah. I would say, and I've been there. I've been like, eh, it's no big deal. Well, sometimes it's a big deal. Mm -hmm. And so if you go, you should just go. Yeah. I know it's terrifying, but knowledge is power. And if you know, you can fix it. So 
So I think as we close up, we should think about what what is maybe one or two things everybody might want to set as an intention for this coming school year. Something yeah. that they can do um, better. I think it's going to be different for everybody. But I think finding finding that thing that you can do be huge. Yeah, I think that if you if you're looking ahead, take think about what you did this summer. Um, you know, I, my my feeds are full of people taking hikes. You can still take your hike all fall, really. Here, it's quite gorgeous, and next spring, so you don't have to wait till the summer to do that. You know, or instead to yourself, okay, this week maybe I'm going to you know not only think about my teaching schedule and maybe reducing a little bit, like shaving 15 minutes off here, or maybe not going as long here, or taking a day off from something and intentionally then replacing it with something that you want to do, whether it's hanging out with your partner or doing something with your family or going golfing, or I'm trying to think of all the things that you like to do, (laughs) right? Golfing or tennis or whatever, right? Or whatever your hobby is outside of your job. Like that's the biggest thing because um, even though we love it, it really consumes our identity sometimes and it causes subconscious stress that we're not necessarily aware of, but it's, it's, it's definitely there. So prioritizing hobbies, movement, hydrate, oh, yeah. sleep and protein, sleep and heart protein. Mm-hmm. Those would be easy, easy fixes. Mm-hmm. And, but I mean, before we end, I, I would say that don't try to do everything all at once. That's overwhelming. That's super overwhelming. And so it goes back to what Crystal said in a classroom where you're trying to teach five minutes of this, five minutes of that, five minutes of whatever. You cannot do that with your health journey either. Like for this month, I am going to prioritize taking a walk four days a week. Okay, perfect. That is that is plenty for the month. If you try to say, I'm going to do this, 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 and this, too much. You're you're gonna you're setting yourself up for failure, and it'll actually cause yourself more stress mm-hmm. by wanting to do all of this. And so when you you, know, you follow wellness people online, and you're like, oh well, you know, they have their entire day with their forty seven self care routines. It's like, no, nobody <laughs> does that. Nobody has time for that. Just pick one thing. We're gonna commit to that one thing, and then like have it stack. Okay, I did one thing. Now when I do my walk, I'm also gonna drink my shake or I'm going to listen to a podcast about something that's you're going to listen to this podcast first (laughs) then you're going to listen to maybe something else that you you want to listen to so one thing that's been big for me too is 10 minutes of stretching in the morning Mm -hmm. um you just feel so different at least I do when I stretch in the morning versus when I do you've made that a habit I have not but that's the thing that's working for you so Mm -hmm. that's why you should do it I think we should have people who are listening to this, and maybe you can like throw a question in the Facebook group or something. But or two thousand um, people. We I love yeah, two thousand people. Great. Right? But I think they're probably mostly bots. <laughs> <laughs> I think it would be great to hear from people, especially in September, as we all start to get going, and what people are trying yeah. after they listen to this and get some ideas in their head about what they might want to try. I would love to hear from people in the group or people who are listening. Whatever everybody's doing. Something about like the accountability of throwing it out into the world. Like, hey, I'm going to do this. It's then you try to maybe do it more because you can put it out into the I world. I did a water so. challenge with somebody in like over a month and I was like really doing a good job. That's awesome. Like, just because I was talking <laughs> to somebody about drinking water. And then another time I did like a 10,000 step challenge mm-hmm. with a couple of people and I was like, I can't believe this. I'm getting my steps. And I still focus on that now, even after the challenge is over. So. Having people kind of chime in, I think it will support a lot of people. We sincerely appreciate you taking your valuable time and listening to the Growing Band Director podcast. Your students are very lucky to have a band director like you. If you have any suggestions for episode topics or think you have an area of expertise to share on a show with us, please reach out. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe. And if you want to help spread the word, please give us a five-star review and tell your band director friends to subscribe as well. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, our YouTube channel, and wherever you listen to podcasts. Thanks for listening to The Growing Band Director. See you next week.